leave him to fully introduce himself and his topic, so please give him a, a warm welcome. Thank you, Roy. Well, I'm a Lancastrian, so I don't know what on earth I'm doing here <laughs> presenting at Agile Yorkshire. Okay. But that was me in 1983, okay, joining a company called Yorkshire General. There's a theme here, isn't there? Yeah? Across the Pennines, Yorkshire General. That was me a year ago as a CIO in a major business running a £4 billion business with a budget of £45 million. That was just to keep the service running, keep the IT lights on. In addition to that, it was about 20 million of change. So, I, I don't know about you, I used to find that a really scary prospect. You know, it was as if like every day I woke up and thought, how on earth, from being this coder, have I ended up as a CIO for a four billion pound business with a 45 million pound budget plus 20 million of change? And I even still carry around with me, I, I, I so wanted to be a coder for the rest of my life. That was when I started as a coder. It was, well, we didn't call them coders in those days. We called them trainee programmers, but it was the same thing. And, uh, you know, I still got the tools of the trade that I used at the time. <laughs> so it's kind of, before you cut any code, before you cut any code, you had to actually draw it out as a flowchart on a piece of paper. You used to get, your hands used to be covered in black ink from kind of the fountain pens that you used. And you had to get, it, get this, you had to get it signed off by your project leader before you could cut any code. And then when you start to cut code, you had to, and this was all COBOL and assembler. Anybody programmed in assembler? Hey, assembler still lives, get in there. It's only one step up from binary, isn't it, really? Yeah. So you had to, because the, the, the code was so kind of uh, technically rich, shall we say, you had to write pseudo code first. So you had to write it out in plain English and get your, you know, after you'd done your flow chart, got that signed off by your team leader, you had to write pseudo code. And then when you were ready to write your code and you, and you kind of did your program, you then had to, because this space was so, so much of a premium, I see the guys laughing here, they know what I'm talk, gonna say next. You had to work out how much disk space you were gonna use, and you had the IBM system reference manual to work out how many, how many reams of disk space, or how many whatever, whatever we used to, call, I can't remember what we used to classify them, but uh, how many disks you were gonna use. And then you had to get that signed off as well. And then you compile this program, compiled it, yeah, it didn't compile automatically. If you could get a terminal, because you shared like, five people between terminals, and then you kind of submit it. And then you got the grumpy operator on the phone saying, is that your job? It's still running, it's using up all the machine resource. I'm gonna cancel it, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, that was the life of a, of a graduate trainee programmer. So how on earth did I end up, uh, did I end up as a CIO? And um, as I say, I found it really scary. And I got loads of, as I went through my career, I got loads of advice on leadership some of which was useful, some of which was horse shit. So the first bit of advice I got was, you're not tall enough to be a leader. <laughs> right? So is that any better? Could you, could, you, could you follow me now? Is that any better? Yeah? It's horse shit, isn't it? Um, the next bit of advice is, you look too young to be a leader. Well, I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of in your genes. You know, if you look young like I do, like people tell me I do, there's kind of not much you can do about it. And you get to a certain age where it becomes an advantage to look a bit younger than, than you actually are. And then the third bit was real kind of weird. It said, your hair's not grey enough. <laughs> now I've heard about products where you can take the grey out of your hair, but I've never come across anything where you can put grey into your hair. Yeah? But it's kind of, it is horseshit, isn't it? So that, that's kind of the advice that I got. Um, but then... As I kind of went through my career, I kind of read, where I put my thing, I read this book, and it was Why Should Anybody Be Led By You? Has anybody read that? Anybody come across it? And it's all about authentic leadership, and something kind of clicked for me, because you can sum it up in six words. Be yourself more often with skill. Sounds really easy, but it's not. And what it means is, if you look at somebody like, I don't know, pick a, pick a great leader, anybody. God, we are devoid of great leaders, aren't we? I don't mean in this room, I mean kind of worldwide. Come on, put yourself out there to be criticised. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, yeah. So you don't get to become a great leader like, like Winston Churchill by trying to be like Winston Churchill. You've got to be yourself with skill. And it was a really harsh lesson for me, and I only realised it when I 
when I kept applying for the head of delivery role, so this was coming through kind of programmer, systems analyst, team leader, and then head of delivery was the first kind of senior leadership role there. So we'd gone through a merger in, the, in 2000, and uh, as you do, you know, you kind of go for your jobs and stuff. And there were loads of head of jobs going, so I thought, right, I'll pitch in for that. So I went through the, one of the dreaded assessment centres, and uh, I thought I'd done really well, and I really gave it everything I'd got. And I remember that conversation, having that conversation with my boss, which I'm sure people will have, it's a quite a common conversation, was, you know what, Dave, you did really well in that assessment, you know, and you really showed us some stuff that we've not seen before, and you really competed well against everybody else. And we're, we really like your kind of group exercise, you really interviewed well, and you sit there thinking, there's a book coming in the minute. Yeah, have you had that kind of conversation? But you haven't got the job. Shit, I haven't got the job. Well, okay, I'll get over it, I'll come back in a week and then tell me what it is that I need to do to get the job. And again, that conversation becomes a bit predictable. It's, well, Dave, you know, you're so close, you're so close, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is that you need to do. You just, I'll tell you, you're just so close and just keep going, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, I got some smiles around the room. People, I think, have had this conversation a few times. So next time it came around, my boss said, oh, Dave, there's a, there's a head off coming up. Why don't, you, why don't you apply for it? I said, well, yeah, okay. So we went through the thing, the group exercise, the interview, the assessment, all the rest of it. Guess what? Dave, you know what? You're so close. You're so close. You've done really well, but you haven't got the job. So the third time came around, and this was, uh, this was about five years later. I got to a point and I thought, I can't go through this again. I thought, I'm gonna go this time, and if I don't get it this time, that's it. I'm not putting myself through this. I'm fed up of having that conversation of, you know what, Dave, you're so close, but not close enough. So I went through and I just thought, and I went to him in the mind, and I had other stuff going on in my life. I was getting divorced at the time, and it was kind of, you know, you've only got, if I'm having this much space to think about work, when stuff like that's happening, you've probably got about that much space. So I just said, right, when is it? What's the day? I'll turn up, I'll do my stuff. I'll perform as best I can. It's up to you guys whether I'm good enough or not. You set the bar, you tell me. So I kind of went in, gave it everything. And then the feedback I got that time was, you know what, Dave, you've got the job. Yes! You cleared the bar by several meters. I don't know why we didn't promote you several years ago. <laughs> Oh, bugger me. I was there. I was doing it. And it was this stuff. What I realized was it was only when I had all that stuff going on in my life and I'd actually let go and, tr you know, and I was trying to be like the other heads of delivery. I was trying to be like Sally Hannington. I was trying to be like Scott McPhee. I was trying to be like Andy Dixon, all these guys that I worked with that I looked up to. I was trying to be them. And actually, having this much space to think about me, I relaxed and I, you know, my state of mind was, I'm just going to be me. It's up to you. And that was a massive lesson for me that I learned. And what I found, I've been suffering from a bout of fake leadership. And there is a lot of fake leadership about, believe me. So I want to I want to talk about Agile now, because that's the uh, the kind of meat in the sandwich, I guess. And uh, you know, my my kind of interactions at board level on Agile. And when you'll all recognize this, yeah, the Agile Manifesto it comes in different colors and different sizes, but it basically says the same thing. And the kind of first conversation you have at board level is about, well, what is Agile? Dave, tell us about Agile. You're the CIO. It's an IT thing. Tell us about Agile. Well, hang on a minute. It's not an IT thing. It's a whole company-wide thing, but we'll put that to one side. And, uh, and what I notice is the execs, they kind of do this little dance, you know, when they're talking about Agile to their mates or their colleagues, they go, we're getting all Agile. Have you seen that? We're going to get agile. And then what the hell is that? Getting agile. It's like a dad dance. My dad dancing is, is anything but agile. But you kind of talk to them about this stuff and what it means. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 let's get agile. Let's get agile. And what they hear is fast, cheap, flexible, and trendy. So it's going to solve all their problems. Yeah, it's going to be great. But very soon what you realize in dealing with these guys is, you're actually, you're actually fitting in, you're fitting Agile in a scrum team into a whole hierarchy, a whole, you know, order, old world order of kind of hierarchies and, um, and waterfall. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't serve you well. Because uh, 
people start chasing you very quickly when you're doing agile is that in the scrum team they say well we need a weekly report or we need a fortnightly report a monthly report you know where's your report it's got to be written down well, we don't do reports we, we kind of have scrums and ceremonies and all the rest of it no no i need a report i need a report it's got to go into the board meeting yeah so you write a report and it reads something like this Project broadly on track with continued good progress in the scrum teams. Great. There are some things we need help with in order to maintain progress. Our third party software partner is about to move two of our key developers to another account. We need help to defer this for at least three months. That would never happen, would it? Issue number two. One of our desktops needs an additional memory card that's been in order for three weeks. We need help to raise a priority, have it in place by the end of this week, otherwise we'll fall behind on development. We're about to lose the space we use for our daily scrum and ceremonies because office space reorganisation. We've been told we have to now book meeting rooms like everybody else. No? Not recognise any of these issues? <laughs> this is the best one. Procurement have said that the company will not be renewing the confluence licences due to a company-wide <laughs> pressure on annual budgets. <laughs> yeah? So. So there's your weekly report, and it goes on, several other issues. So what happens is, it kind of gets passed up this hierarchy, gets to program level, and they say, well, we need a summary of that, we can't include all that. And then it gets to uh, sponsor, oh no, no, I've only got to write a few lines, so that's got to go. And then it gets to, uh, gets to program board, no, forget it. And then it gets into the exec board pack, which is usually about that thick. It's got all the governance and all the regulation, all the compliance, all the shit they've got to put in there just because it's got to be in there to evidence it to the regulators. And what does your report say? Project broadly on track. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really helpful, isn't it? That's really going to get some stuff done. That's really going really to help the agile scrum. And then they, you get the the governance monkeys come chasing you for measurement because you've got to measure everything. If you, can't, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? Yeah? So you've got to measure it. What can I measure? Well, you know, we don't do time, cost and quality. Well, I've got to measure something. I've got to put it in the board pack. It's got to be measurable because that's how we work. You know, we're a measurement company. You say, well, okay, well, uh, let's measure velocity. So you show them a velocity chart. They say, yeah, that's it. Let's put that in the board pack. And then they go, hang on a minute. What's that? <laughs> the velocity's gone down. What happened there? And you go, no, no, you don't understand. You know, velocity goes up and down. It depends what your backlog is and what your makeup of your team is and what your... Oh, shit, are we going to... You better write something about that. You better write a full page on that and then I can, I can kind of uh, summarise it for you. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah, you get it? So then, well, I've called the Usain Bolt indicator because <laughs> velocity's got to get faster. It's got to go like that, hasn't it? Yeah? Because that's the hierarchy of fitting in. That's how sales figures go. That's how expenses go. But that's how profit goes, yeah? In most organisations. So you're fitting into that. So then you get the, the governance junkies. They think of all weird and wonderful ways of representing this. Just basically to show off that their chart is better. You know, earned value against normalised velocity. What does that mean? What does that mean? And the reports get smaller and smaller because you're trying to cram more and more on that. And then there's an edict goes out to say, everybody's got to report in the same way. So you kind of get that. <laughs> so that's what the board pack looks like. And at least, and the governor's junkie said, so that's great because every report is in the same format. Isn't that great? It's all shit. It means nothing. It means nothing in waterfall terms, never mind agile terms. How agile are we? That's another question that gets asked in organisations. How agile are we? So this is usually a self-assessment process where projects are asked, are you agile? Of course. Are you working agile? <laughs> are you working agile? Are you working agile? Are you working agile? Everybody nods sagely and says, yeah, I'm working agile. Yeah? Well, where's it going to go? It's always going to get 100%. You might as well ask people, do you want your bonus this year? Because <laughs> if you're not working agile and you don't fill the reporting, then it's a black mark and you might not get your bonus. And I've seen these things, these charts, where somebody, one of the governance junkies does an extrapolation where you're more than 100% agile. <laughs> so it's great, in December we're going to be 150% agile. <laughs> Fantastic! What does it mean? What does it mean? Why would you want to be? 
So coming back to the, the manifesto, once these things start to work through the system, yeah, you get kind of panic in the boardroom. So you've got, well, you know, we're out of control. We've got no governance because we can't produce reports. We can't measure stuff. Velocity isn't increasing. Oh, no, we've got no SLAs because we've got no contracts, no contract negotiation, no plan. And believe me, from the conversations I had, there is nothing strikes more fear and panic at the exec table to say, we haven't got a plan. We've given you two years worth of budget and you're telling me you haven't got a plan. So what do they do? They press the panic button. And actually, when you, when you unpack all this stuff, what do you guys in the scrums actually need? What does the Agile project actually need from board level? Well, it needs decisions often. And I had a, I had a group of BAs come to me uh, just over a year ago, and they'd done a, a systems thinking intervention on some work that they'd done. Has anybody done systems thinking? Well, you, it, the essence of it is you kind of, you start off by looking back and saying, well, what happened? And what, what can we measure? What does that tell us? So they've done, uh, you know, techniques that you'll be familiar with, brown paper, post-it notes, and they mapped out all the work they've done on multi-product discount. So multi-product discount is a really simple concept in any industry, whether it's insurance or anything else. It's if you've got a customer with more than one product, do you want to give them a discount? Simple, yeah? This team has spent 18 months working on multi-product discount. 18 months! They started off with one BA, and after 18 months, they had five BAs working on it. Five BAs. And they still hadn't got a decision. And they came to me and said, what on earth is going on? And if you looked at the systems thinking intervention, they'd been for a decision probably about five times, and the decision every single time was, we need more analysis. What should we do? Or oh, put some more BAs on it. That's it. Made a decision, we put more BAs on it, so we'll get more analysis. Really? And I, I talked to them about something, about the, the emotional side of decision making. And I've run whole separate workshops on this, but I just wanted to give you some insight on this. So if you've got a BA, and then you've got a deci the decision maker actually looks a bit like Jack Whitehall's dad. It's not meant to be. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was the best picture I could get of a, of a so-called wise sage. But what do you think when you go, when they went to that decision maker for a decision, what are the two questions that you think are on his or her mind as a decision maker to make a big decision. <laughs> yeah, a bit more emotional than uh, that. And the hook. Yeah, who's going to get blamed if it's the wrong one? Yeah. What benefits it brings? Yeah. How long it'll take? Yeah. Anything else emotional? Would it be my fault if it's wrong? Yeah, I think we've got the two there. Um, so, what they were doing is going with more and more technical information because we're getting, doing more and more analysis, yeah? But actually, the two questions they'd overlooked are, what will I tell my boss? So a number of decision makers I've sat in front of, and as soon as you give them that gold nugget that makes sense of what they'll tell the boss, suddenly they relax and you get a whole different conversation. So what they're worried about is if they're running Project, Project Marvel, to coin a name, if they're running Project Marvel, if they bump into their boss in the corridor the day after and they haven't got that kind of lift conversation, they'll feel exposed. And they've, they've already had the conversation with them, how's Project Marvel going? Oh, it's great, we're going agile. Yeah, I've done the agile dance. So that'll get them through a few weeks. But actually, they need another story. They need, to, you know, they need to get beyond that. So you've got to feed these guys with the sound bites for their bosses. And some of the best agile projects I've seen are the ones where they build a little app. So they kind of put it on the firm and then they, when you go and, see, you go and see the stakeholders, you say, oh, you know, come and have a look at this app. We've got a really good app. And they'll say, oh, can I have that on my phone? Yeah, yeah, we'll send it to you. You have it, yeah, you can download it. You have it on your phone. So when they see their boss and they say, how's Project Marvel going? They say, oh, I've got this great app. You know, and the boss will say, oh, can I have it on my phone? And soon, all the exec have got it. It's like a virus. It's kind of gone, gone through all the exec. They're all showing off because basically these are, these are guys and gals with big egos. That, that's usually how they've got to that position. And they like showing off. So the way to, to, you've got to feed the beast. You've got to play them in this game and just give them those little sound bites, those little wins. And it does work, believe me. It's certainly a lot easier than kind of fighting against the tide and trying to explain what velocity is and why velocity doesn't always increase in the scrum teams and all the rest of it. 
Yeah, really simple messages. Give them something to tell their boss. And the other thing they're worried about, as a few people alluded to, will I get fired? And it's a really basic kind of human instinct. And again, the majority of senior leaders in the majority of organizations walk around every day with a fear of getting fired. And I used to as well. It's, it's a real fear, you know. Call it imposter syndrome, call it getting found out, whatever it is. But if you're asking them to make that really big decision and they're sat there thinking, this sounds all right, but what if it goes wrong while I get fired? You're never going to get a decision out of them. And, you know, it's a reality. As human beings, we only do things for pain or gain. So think about it. Everything you do in your life, every choice you make, it's either to avoid some big pain or it's to get a big gain. Yeah? Think about those conversations with your partner. Yeah? How many of those are avoiding pain? You know, I'd love to go and see the football on Saturday, but, yeah, I'm not sure. You're supposed to be going to see the Christmas lights being switched on. Well, it'd be great to be at the football, but I won't have to get told off if I'm not at that thing I've promised to be at that everybody else is going to. Yeah? So, I know it's a bit mean, but in some cases with these senior guys, you've got to create some pain. And so, so the conversation we went back to the guys with is, guys, we've been looking at multi-product discount now for 18 months. Yeah? The scrum team are ready to implement this stuff and implement these features. And they can do it this week. But you've got to decide by Friday. If you don't decide by Friday, it drops out of the backlog and you won't be able to do it. So what do you want to do? And I used to find at board level the best conversations were the ones that ended with, so what do you want to do? Because you've got to present the stuff in terms they understand. And I explained once to my sponsor that, uh, you know, the guy I was working for, who was, uh, was responsible for spending 45 million quid of his, of his money on just IT, on just keeping the service going, who ran this, who, he was CEO for the four billion pound business. He, he actually, have you, you've seen train spotting, yeah? Yeah. Do you remember Begbie at train spotting? Yeah. Well, if you cross Begbie, if Begbie ever mated with Roy Keane, <laughs> right. then that's what my sponsor was like a really tough Glaswegian guy you know, great guy to work with but he was really direct and really tough and we used to have some kind of really good conversations but you know with these guys you've got to, you've got to create some pain for them and you've got to and, and it, he said to me when I, when I was leaving he said to me uh, how are we going to get a replacement for you Dave I said, well, I don't know. It's not my problem. So, you know, I'm going. I've, I've handed my notes in. I've worked for six months. I'm going. And uh, he said, well, what kind of person do you think we need? And I, I went away and thought about it and then came back to him and I said, well, I look at it really simple like this. You know, the guys, the guys who I work with in IT as a CIO, they speak Russian, right? And then when I come to board level, the guys at board level understand Chinese. I said, so my job is mainly as an interpreter to be able to speak Russian and Chinese. And he said, yeah, that's it. He said, that's it. Find me somebody who can speak Russian and Chinese. Because if you didn't have to do that level of interpretation and conversion, then you could actually send that guy, that, that tough Glaswegian, Begbie, Roy Keane, you could send him into the scrum teams and he'd be able to say, well, this is what I want you to do. And the guys in the scrum teams would be able to understand what he wanted. But I've tried that. It's a disaster. Because one of them speaks Chinese, one of them speaks Russian. It doesn't work which is why there'll always be jobs for guys like me, because, you know, speak both languages. But this is kind of really quite basic stuff. So coming back to decision-making, I, I, if, I, if I could ever add a fifth thing to the, uh, to the manifesto, it's decision over, over precision. So in how many organisations do we go over and over and over and over again, doing more and more data analysis, putting more BAs on it, when actually, as leaders, we're paid to make decisions? If it was as simple as just gathering more data, then you get AI to do it. Why would you need people involved? You've got to make decisions most of the time based on gut feel, based on incomplete data. And Agile is no different to that. In fact, it probably accentuates the problem more. And then you get into testing. And however, what I used to find was, however Agile the project was, you always seem to have a big cycle of testing at the end of it, where everybody chucks all their stuff into test, yeah? Why are you laughing? That can't, can't be true, can it? Yeah? So you, you kind of throw it over the fence of the test, guys. 
and then at the steering groups, in so many steering groups where you're looking at the, the test velocity there. And again, you know, I've put whose truth is it anyway? Who are we kidding ourselves? So you look at this, and here's a project that should have implemented here, right? Well, it didn't get off to a great start because the velocity kind of, the test velocity kind of widened, the, the gap widened significantly even from week four, yeah? So suddenly you're heading in this direction. And if you look at the actual, the bottom line there, the indicative fall velocity, you know, it's going to miss, it's going to miss the revised launch date by some way. You know, that says October, it's going to be December or into the following year. But the number of times I've sat at steering groups, and what you do is, you kind of massage the figures and you say, well, you know, we can increase, we can increase the velocity. The test velocity is going to increase. So we're going from, you know, 180 tests per week, sorry, 133 tests per week, we're going to get up to 200 tests per week. And you're sat in the back of your mind thinking, how are you going to do that? Just tell me again, how are you going to do it? Oh, we're bringing some more guys in and the supplier's going to do this and this and this. And it's just like, kind of do a little tap dance and, you know, you just get through the steering group. And I've had, I've had big projects, you know, major undertakings, like 20 million quid, where you just, have, you just got to have a tumbleweed moment. You just got to face up to it. Have you seen that, um, that film, A Few Good Men? It's quite an old one, yeah? And when Tom Cruise says, I need the truth, And Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. And I've lost count of the number of sponsors that have said to me in the past, at board level, I want the truth. And you look at them, you think, mate, if you really knew what was going on, you just, would, <laughs> you just wouldn't want to know. You just wouldn't want to know. But I think, you know, coming back to the chart, we've all got a part to play in this. You know, if you're, if you're on the Agile team looking at that, is that going to happen? Well, probably not. You know, again, you just... Who are we fooling? Whose truth is it anyway? And then what I've called a strictly showstopper dance. So you get to implementation, yeah? And you're about to implement, and then you get all your product owners together, and you say, right, how many, how many showstopper defects have we got? And this is real data for a real project. And we got together every Friday and said, right, you know, we're going to launch. We'll get together this Friday and see if we can launch in a week's time, because that week will give us time to prepare to go live, yeah? So, uh, so you get together, get in a room, all the stuff, you get all the data out. How many showstoppers have we got? And we started off with 20. So the guys went away, fixed most of those. We got together a week after, how many showstoppers have we got? Counting them up, we had 20. And we met the third week, same ritual dance. How many showstoppers have we got? We got 20. And it was always a different 20 when we looked at them because we fixed some, but then we found some more. And you go, well, hang on a minute. If we'd have been ready to go live last Friday, you wouldn't have found this one that you found in the last week because we would have stopped testing. So where's that one come from? So how many, and you kind of think, how many showstoppers are going to come out? And what you realize people are doing is a showstopper dance. So of those eight or 10 product owners, you said to the first one, have you got any showstoppers? And they say, yeah, yeah, we've got this, we've got this. And everybody else goes, great. It's not going to be my showstopper that stops us going live. It's going to be his. So I'll just tuck him behind him. So we won't be going live because he's got, He's got three showstoppers, so I'll just get all, out all mine and call them showstoppers. Yeah? So you kind of have this, this rolling 20. So I got so frustrated with this, I said to my program manager, I said, we've got to ask a different question. So the following Friday, we got together and we said, right, we're going live, and you've got to look at each of your showstoppers and think really hard about this, because if we didn't go live this weekend and the chief exec came into the project on Monday and said, did you go live? And you say, no, we didn't. And he asked why. Would you, with your showstopper, be, be happy to stand in front of the CEO and say, we didn't go live because of this showstopper. That stopped us going live. Because if you can't, it ain't a showstopper, right? So if it's stuff like, well, we didn't go live because we, can't, we actually can't collect any money and can't collect any premiums, we can't bank it, so we can't trade with customers, your chief exec could probably say, well, yeah, that sounds pretty serious, actually. We've got to, you know, come on, guys, we've got to be able to collect money, get it fixed. And it was really interesting because we got a really different reaction when we did that. Suddenly, critical defects came down to five. So 15 of them evaporated immediately. <laughs> and we got a really different reaction from the team because nobody wanted to be the person stood in front of that chief exec saying that, 
we didn't go live because of their showstoppers. So guess what? They weren't really showstoppers. But everybody was doing the showstopper dance. And as a leader, when you, when you go into scrum teams, you know, you kind of walk in. In my experience, you walk into scrum teams and they're all busy, they're all active, they're all doing stuff and it looks great. But then as soon as somebody says, oh, you know, Dave's come to see us today because he's CIO for this four billion pound business and we're implementing this 20 million pound project and he just wants to kind of get close to the scrub. You get a really different reaction. Like rabbits in the headlights and, oh, what do we say to Dave? What do we tell him? What do we not tell him? You know, people just stand there looking for leadership as if I know more about Agile than they do. You know, how's that ever going to happen? Yeah. So as a leader, there's a, I always found there's a real trick and there's two things that are really important to that. Part of it is that authenticity that I talked about earlier. And the other thing is vulnerability. So when I go into the scrums, I used to talk about, well, you know, I used to work in IT and I kind of was a coder and, you know, maybe, maybe show them that thing. But, you know, just to try and kind of identify with the guys. I'm an IT guy, and that's all I ever wanted to be. I didn't want to be a CIO, I wanted to be an IT guy. So I'm kind of like you guys, you know? Um, but the other thing about vulnerability is just, people have this, this kind of view of you as a CIO and as a senior leader and as a, as a kind of board member, that um, yeah, first of all, you know everything. And secondly, you've got all the answers. But if you actually play back the reality of what it is, and say stuff like, well, you know what? I'm gonna really get my ass kicked on Monday about this program because I've heard that this has happened and that's happened. So I need you guys to really help me with this and really tell me what, what's going on and what needs to be done. and What help do you need from these guys upstairs? And eventually what they'll say is, well, we've been working on multi-product discount for 18 months and we haven't got a decision. So, you know, but it, from, that, from that group of people, it takes kind of, well, you know, and you see him kind of, shall we tell him about multi-product discount? Well, no, I don't think he's here to it. Well, no, it's holding us up. Or this stuff that I talked about, you know, we're going to lose our scrum room. We can't get the Confluence licenses updated. We need a new memory card over here. And that's gold dust. That's gold dust for me because I can, I can fix that stuff and I can get it done. And in fact, if you get the execs out of the boardroom, and try and teach about Agile, you know, and get them down to the ceremonies, get them into the scrums. The advice I always give people is to give them something really easy to do. You know, give them a job to do that anybody could do, but make it look as if only they could do it. <laughs> and that does two things. It gives them a real, well, it probably does three things. It gives them a really warm glow, makes them feel like they're involved and that they know about Agile. What's the third one? gives them something to tell their boss when they bump into him. How's Project Marvel going? Oh, I've just, um, I've just spent time actually with the Agile team. I've just been with them on the ground and uh, I've sorted out all their confluence problems and I've got them a new memory card and, you know, I've told procurement we're going to renew all the licenses and, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've got them new space to work in. So, you know, and they kind of beat their chest about that stuff. And some of it is stuff anybody could have done, but you give them a job to do. And what it also does is keep them out of mischief. So by giving them something to do, it stops them asking you those stupid questions like, how's your velocity going and why has it gone down? <laughs> yeah? This is it's basic kind of, a lot of basic human stuff here, but it works. I want just to, to kind of share something else about my, my kind of leadership style and the big influence that that's had on me. I just need to need to kind of give you some background at first. We'll go back three years to uh, 2015. And uh, unfortunately, I had a period where I wasn't very well and I was off work for a couple of months. And uh, when I got back to work, I got one of those emails from my boss's boss saying, we're just going through a merger and uh, you all have to go and apply for your jobs again. So I'm thinking, oh, I remember this from when I applied for my job as a head of and didn't get it. And gone th So this is about the sixth time I'd gone through this kind of ritual dance of applying for your own job. So, um, so I filled in all the forms and everything and, uh, you know, I got the job as a CIO looking after the four billion pound business, 45 million pound budget, 20 million pounds of change working for the cross between Begbie and Roy Keane. Yeah. Um, and that was great. You know, really pleased to be part of the organization. But when I spoke to the medics when I was going back to work, they said two things. They said, 
you can only go back on a part-time basis until you've run, you know, run, in, run back into the job and got up to speed, and you can't travel. I kind of thought, okay, and everybody was really understanding, you know, you start this new job, you can't travel, you're only working kind of up until about one o'clock every day. Um, then you've got to, well, frankly, go home and have a sleep, I was knackered. But um, the problem was the new job had people in seven different sites through the country. And that wasn't unusual, a lot of people in my position did. But um, as the weeks went by, this, this kind of authentic leadership thing that I'd kind of hung my hat on a few years before started to build up. And I thought, well, everybody knows that I can't go out and visit the new people, you know, two companies coming together and, it, and more than 50% of the people I was supposed to be leading I'd never met face to face because they were from the other company in other sites. And so as the weeks went by, this pressure was building up and it was a kind of self-imposed pressure, which was that self-talk that we all do, which is, you know, whatever the subject is, in my case, the subject was authentic leaders spend time with their people. People you're leading out there will be thinking, where's Dave? We've never met him. And even though they know. And in the end, it kind of built up and built up. And it got to one Friday afternoon and I actually, I actually thought, I'm going to have to write an email to these people, directly to these people, not through layers of management. I'm going to have to write to... So get me the circulation list, I'll write an email. And I brought it along just to uh, talk through what I wrote. So you've got to... You've got to hold this because it's, it's quite a difficult story to tell because it's very personal. So this is what I wrote to those people. Um, I'm conscious you're probably thinking, who is this Dave Harper fella who's been appointed to change an IT director and why haven't we seen him in person? I wanted to do a short note to answer at least one of these questions in advance of meeting you all face to face. The last year has been really tough for me, having been diagnosed last September with with early signs of prostate cancer. Not what I was expecting, having been back three weeks from holiday in America, but I'm a great believer that adversity can make you stronger in the long run, though it doesn't always feel like it at the time. I'm just emerging from the other end, having had treatment in February and having been off work March and April. However, my back to work program, if you can call it that, does mean that I'm currently working part-time days and long distance travel is out of the question which is why I haven't been able to visit any of the sites to meet you personally. This should change in the next few weeks, and I'm planning to be down in Bristol, uh, 22nd of June, so I hope to meet you all for the first time then. And once I'd sent that, it was just like a huge pressure had gone, just like popping a balloon. Suddenly I'd done something about it. All this pressure was building up, I'd just like a release valve had just gone. And I got a few replies, but the one that really struck home was this one. This was somebody in Bristol who I'd never, ever met before. He was in my team, who that email had gone to. And he said, hi, Dave, thanks for this. Sounds like you've been through the ringer a bit, but I can really relate to that as my mother's been diagnosed with brain tumours a couple of weeks ago, and I'm trying to deal with all that entails. Given that, and the fact we've been... The fact that despite working in the same building for over 17 years, I'm on my fourth company. I'm fairly philosophical about everything that's going on, but the sentiment is certainly appreciated. Keep fighting, and I hope the recovery continues. And I sat at my desk and I thought, I kind of can't believe that, that I sent this email out because I was feeling the pressure, and somebody I've never even met before is suddenly talking to me about their mother having brain tumours. How does that happen? And I think it's back to that vulnerability thing. As a leader, although leaders don't naturally do it, and fake, the book of fake leadership certainly doesn't include it. But if you look at the great leaders, they, what they often do very subtly is expose their vulnerability. And I didn't send that email thinking, oh, I must be vulnerable because I've read the authentic leadership booklet and it says be more vulnerable, but with skill. I just did it because it, it kind of seemed like the right thing to do. I wanted to talk directly to these people and that seemed a way to do it but I was amazed at what came back and what that guy told me. Are we back on? Should be. No, hang on. There we go, yeah. So, <laughs> flick the switch, yeah. There you go, it's all planned. It's all planned. We knew what was happening. We knew what was happening. Comedy effect, yeah. In presentations as in life, comedy, everything is worth timing in comedy. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, something, something else happened at that point, so uh, I got some feedback from my boss, my IT boss, 
And he said, Dave, he said, uh, something's changed. I said, what do you mean something's changed? He said, well, there's been a real, a real step up in your performance. My first thought was, how shit was I before? <laughs> but but he, he'd sort of seen something. And when I thought it through, then, yeah, something had happened. And I'd let go of a lot of the fears that I'd held, some of which were held since childhood. And just to, get, just to give you an example, uh, one of the first things I did in the job that I had, the CIO job, the four billion pound budget, yeah, you, you know all that. It wasn't a four billion pound budget, actually. It was, I wish it was, but four billion pound business. Um, one of the first jobs I got was to look at a plan that we'd been given by a third party supplier. And it was for a big contract that we were, we were about to sign. And my sponsor, the, the kind of Begby Roy King guy, said, Dave, you're the IT guy, have a look at that. You know? And what was it? It was like three PowerPoint slides. That was what purported to be a plan from the supplier. Yeah, have you seen those kind of plans? Planning by PowerPoint. So I thought, well, this is probably all shit, but we'll have a look at it anyway. And I got, a, I got a team of people together and we focused on what did we know about this supplier, what was this plan, what was their delivery track record and all the rest of it. And I thought, you know, coming in a merger situation where we kind of, I didn't know a lot of the people, I assembled what I thought and what I was told was a really great team, really great technical team. And we only had about a week and a half to, to have a look at this. And I went back to that sponsor and I said, right, I said, uh, I said this is what we think. So I talked him through and I said, you can, you can boil it down to two recommendations. First one, this supplier isn't mature enough to do more than one thing at once for us. So only give them one big thing to do at once. So always have a priority list and always know what your main thing is because otherwise it will be an accidental outcome if they're doing too many things. And the other recommendation is if they say it'll take a year, add 50% on. So it'll take them 18 months. That's our experience. So I kind of taken all this complexity and all this three page PowerPoint plan and boiled it all down into these two recommendations. And he said, yeah, that's great, Dave. That's, you know, it's really practical. Let's take that to the board to get it signed off. So they'll, you know, when they're talking about the contract, should they sign talking about the financials, talking about, and he got to my slot on the agenda at the board. And it was only like five minute slot. So I just talked them through that. And I said, right, two recommendations, 50% contingency plus prioritized list, only given one thing to do at a time. And on each of those, one of the other guys around the table on the board shouted me down on both things. So he wasn't the sponsor. He was just a guy who worked with this organization before. And he said, well, he said, you know, last time we worked with them, he said, I know you'd say that. He said, but last time we worked with them, you know, we set the timescales, we pushed them too hard and, and all the rest of it. So that's, you know, and he said, we, you know, they, they only had one main thing to do, but we kept changing our requirements. So it's not, wasn't really their fault. It was our fault. And it's like a defining moment in your career where you sat at a board and you think, we've worked really hard on this. I've had a top team on it. I'm coming with these recommendations. And the sponsor who sat next to me has signed them off. Here I am in front of the board. And that guy there is shouting me down and making me look an idiot as if I haven't done my research proper. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of career changing decision. Do you take this guy on at the board? Or do you kind of walk away and bury it? So I decided not to take him on there and then, but I went home and the meeting was in London. I came back to, uh, came back to York Wales base and I couldn't sleep that night. And I thought, I'm not having this. You know, we've done a really good job. I'm just not having it. So the next day happened to be the day I was back at the hospital for a, uh, my screen's gone off again, I don't mind. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so the next day I was, uh, yeah. Not, Next day I was back at the hospital having a checkup, you know, a regular checkup for my prostate cancer. And um, I remember getting to the car park at the hospital and sitting in my car. And all I should have been thinking about at that point was, I wonder what the results are going to be like. This is kind of life threatening. I hope the treatments worked and I hope I get signed off or at least I'm making some recovery. But all I could think about was this git at the, at the board meeting who'd shout me down. And before I went into the hospital, I thought, I've got to make a phone call. And I know exactly what phone call I'm going to make. So I got on the phone and I rang this guy, the Begbie, Roy Keane. And I said, uh, oh, I said, uh, just, just following up on yesterday, I said, what do you think of the meeting? He said, well, I thought it was okay. So, you know, we got sign off and we're going to sign the contract. He said, what do you think? I said, well, did you notice that on both points that we'd agreed, when I, when I put those on the table, I got shouted down on both points. And he said, yeah, I did notice that. He said, what did you make of that? 
I said, well, I'll tell you what I made of it. My job here as your CIO is to tell you what you need to know, not necessarily what you want to hear. I said, so as long as we're understanding that, I'll do a fantastic job for you. If that's not what you want, then I'm in the wrong job and I'll go and get a different job. And he said, Dave, that's exactly what I want you to do. He said, I'm really glad you've raised it for me. And then a couple of days later, my, my CIO boss in IT came back and he said, I've had some really great feedback. He says, you're doing a fantastic job, even though you've just started as a CIO. And he wants you to carry on doing what you're doing. He said, I don't know where it came from. He said, he didn't say, he just kind of, he just kind of called me at the end of a meeting and told me that. So that kind of feedback loop was working. But why am I telling you that story? Well, the significance of that is, if you go back before I had cancer, I wouldn't have had that conversation with him. I would have buried it. I would have rationalized it away and said, well, yeah, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we should have done some more work. Maybe we should have put some more business analysts on it. Maybe we should have looked at it. Maybe I didn't present it right. Maybe that guy's right. Maybe we did keep changing our requirements. Maybe I've been too harsh. Maybe I'll do it better next time. And just buried it. But I'd let go of those fears. And now I think it's a kind of fake fear. We talk about leadership, fake leadership. It's fake fear. Why was I carrying all those fears around? And when I talk about this to people, people say, well, it's all right for you. You've had cancer. <laughs> and I go, I beg your pardon? Well, it's, you know, it's all right for you letting go of these fears. You've had cancer. Okay, well, so what are you going to do then? Are you just going to sit around waiting for that life-changing, life-threatening disease to hit you and carry all these fears around? And when it does eventually hit you, then you'll let go of the fears. What are you going to do? What's the alternative? So if I could give a gift to everybody in this room, it would be to help you let go of those stupid fake fears that we carry around at work without having to go through a life-threatening disease. Do you reckon you can do that? Easy, isn't it? Be yourself more often with skill. Easy. So that was the view I had out the window in London on the 29th of September 2014. And that's a really significant day because that's the day I took the phone call to say I got cancer. And the fact I was in London and not in the consultant's office tells you something. That in my head I'd already convinced myself I didn't have cancer even though I'd had all the tests. And I'd had a little blood test that said, you know, you need to get further tests and all the rest of it. I had the further test done and the biopsy, which kind of makes you walk like John Wayne, but I won't go into that. Um, the, uh, you know, and I convinced myself when I was at work, just sat in a room in London on the 24th floor, just waiting for a call from the consultant. And he said, I've got some, I've got some bad news and some good news. He says, we found some cancer but it's not gonna spread that fast. I said, hang on a minute, just run that good news past me again. <laughs> and it was just completely devastating. I, I, you know, and I still remember that day in vivid detail. I just left the meeting that I was supposed to be rejoining, just caught a train back to York. And I felt like just kind of burying my head under the covers and just, and just being on my own and just going to sleep for weeks. That's all I felt like. But then, a year later, the 29th of September 2015, I was in London again with pretty much a similar view. And it was completely by coincidence. I only realized when I was getting on the train to London in the morning that it was a year, since, exactly a year to the day since I'd been uh, diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I was in kind of the, uh, the meeting with my sponsor talking about his four billion pound business. And uh, at the end of the meeting, he got me and one of the other sponsors to stay behind because there, there was a project where we spent five million quid it was supposed to be working agile. It was a complete stuff up. And we'd estimated there's probably another five million pounds to spend. And he wasn't happy. And he was right not to be happy. But he got me and the sponsor to stay behind afterwards. And he gave us a proper telling off, a real proper right royal telling off. And as he was, as he was kind of looking at me and doing all this, you know, and it's, it's kind of the Begbie Roy King guy, tough Glaswegian. It's, you know, pretty direct and pretty scary. And we sat there and you kind of, and as I looked over his shoulder, that was the view I got. And again, something had happened, that, that switch that had been flicked. 
in my head I was saying to myself, you're not happy, and I know why you're not happy, and you're giving me a real telling off, but actually I'm just glad to be still alive today, and I'm glad to be here getting this bollocking from you. <laughs> That's what I was saying in my head. So six months earlier, that would have destroyed me, because ever since, ever since childhood I carry around this fear, fear of authority, fear of being told off. And it manifests in different ways. You know, I blush easy, so, you know, somebody tells me off, I start blushing. Or, you know, getting fidgety. In an extreme case, it's just, you know, going into a panic or having a panic attack. That's what, you know, that's what I did as a child. But somehow, and there's, the thing I want to get across to you is there's nothing neurological or physical or chemical about the treatment for cancer that makes your fears go away. And I've talked to other people with life-threatening or debilitating uh, illnesses. Um, there's a guy I know really well called David Beckham, and it's not the David Beckham, obviously. I wouldn't, you know. But, uh, you know, who I used to work with, and he's got Parkinson's disease, which is a different kind of outcome because it's debilitating over a long period of time. And we sit there and we have conversations about fear and about overcoming fear. And he goes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, that happened to me. And the treatment is completely different. But why do we carry around all these fake fears? Why does it manifest itself? And why, if you want your performance to improve, there's a really easy way to do it. Just let go of those stupid fears that we all carry around. There's a great, some great books on this, and I read the uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Have you read that? Anybody read that? Anybody seen that? I've heard the quote a lot. Yeah. Not yeah. And it's kind of based on, you know, the only thing to fear is fear itself. If you stop yourself being frightened of fear, you've, you've cracked it. Yeah, and it gives loads of examples, you know, and you can guarantee if you read the book, you relate to about kind of 30, 40% of the examples that it gives, you know, not necessarily all of them, but real life examples. And, uh, you know, we're only born with two fears. Does anybody know what those fears are? Fear Sorry, you said that? Fear of yeah, that's one of them. What's the other one? Yeah, fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. So where does all the other shit come from? <laughs> yeah, it's all learned behavior that we learn, that we acquire, that we pack away and make it real. It's fake, it's fake fear. So a final thought on this is, um, is it that what I've been through really makes you think and really made me think. And it, I think about how much in our lives we work, you'll be familiar with the term right to left plan and left to right plan, yeah? We kind of work on projects. So we go through life with this great left to right plan, don't we? That, you know, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to get a good education, and then when I leave school, you know, I'll maybe go to university, get a degree, and then, you know, at some point in that, I'll meet a partner, and maybe settle down with a partner, you know, and we'll maybe have children. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing about having children, when they get to a certain age, you just think, when are we going to get rid of these children? So... <laughs> So kind of, you know, when we get rid of the children, look at all the things we can do together as a couple. You know, look, at, look how good life will be. And then you get to a certain age and you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s, so, you know, at 55, George Osborne said I can get my money out of my pension. So all this money I've been putting in, I can get out. Wow, think about this. The kids have left home. You know, they're no longer at university, no longer financially dependent. So they can, you know, we can go on that cruise of always wanted to do or that round the world trip. We can go and see the ashes in Australia, whatever you want to do. And then, you know, we can slow down a bit, but, you know, we can buy that second home in the sun. And wouldn't it be great, you know, all that time we'll have when we, uh, when we retire. So that's your kind of left to right plan. But what about your right to left plan? What if you're going through that life and you get to a point and you bump into this guy with a big black cloak on, hood up, and a scythe? Yeah? And he says, where are you going? So, well, you know, I'm just, you know, at 55, I can access my pension. So we've got all these plans. We're going around the world and we're going to Australia to see the ashes and we're going to you know, buy a dream home in, uh, in Spain. and gonna... Really? No, you're not. And there's no negotiating with this guy. He just says, you know what? You, you're coming with me. Shit, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? So I would urge all of you, please, if there's something that you need to do in your life, 
a conversation you need to have, whether it's at work, whether it's with your partner, some little thing you've been putting off, little thing you think you'll do when you, re when you retire, little thing you'll do in five years, kick it into long grass. For goodness sake, do it now because tomorrow might be too late. Thank you very much.